Welcome to the Women and Wealth Podcast with Esther Sabo. Esther is a respected leader in the field of personal financial advice with over 25 years of experience. After going through her own significant and challenging life-changing events, she overcame fear and self-doubt to launch her own successful advisory firm. Now Esther is ready to share her practical and personal experiences to help other women clear their hurdles and brave life's transitions. In this way, she inspires women to lead fulfilling and confident lives. Hello and welcome to Women in Wealth with Esther Sabo from Gates Pass Advisors. Esther, good morning. How are you? Hi, Eric. Good morning. I am great. We just got back, my husband and I, from celebrating our second wedding anniversary out in beautiful South Dakota. Yeah, the Black Hills. That is so exciting. Did you have fun? Oh, it was just so beautiful. It was amazing. Just beautiful 70 degree weather, blue, blue skies. Mm -hmm. The kind of thing that you go, gosh, I could live here. But then people say, oh, no, 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 it's not like this all the time. (laughs) It's going to snow next week. Winter is coming. Yeah. (laughs) That's right. Yeah. The Black Hills aren't nearly as black when they're covered with white. So that's all there is to it. Right. Oh, man. So today you guys are talking about uh, property and casualty insurance and you have a guest on the show, right? I do. And before people go, oh, no, property and casualty insurance is so important. And typically, most of us get our information in the mail and go, yeah, whatever. And I say this, I've said this for years, you can have a fabulous financial plan, you can have a wonderful investment portfolio. But if something happens in your life, and you're not adequately covered, it can change everything in a heartbeat, typically because of an accident. So I'm really grateful to have Derry Wisdom on with us, and I'm going to turn her introduction over to you, Eric, and then we'll launch right in. Yeah, I'm so excited to be able to, uh, to introduce the audience to her bio. Uh, it's, it's robust, so I appreciate that. Derry, thank you so much for joining us. Derry Wisdom has been a private client advisor since 2010, specializing in providing high-value home, auto, collections, and excess liability coverage for successful families in the Bay Area, Pacific Northwest, and across the United States. Her specialty is complex risk mitigation for individuals, families, business owners, family offices, and private equity professionals. Derry, thank you so much for joining Esther today. Thank you for having me. And I'm so glad to have you on, Derry, because I just uh, we've been working together for a number of years now. And again, for the audience, just so you know, for whoever I refer or recommend, there's no financial arrangement between any firm and Gates Pass Advisors. The only one who pays us is our clients. So, Derry, um, let's talk a little bit about what you do. Uh, we, we covered a lot here in the bio, but I know one of the things is that you, you are a private client advisor. And how might that be different than one's, you know, the more typical type of insurance agent, so to speak? Well, that's a great question, Esther. Thank you. Yeah, so I'm an insurance broker. And I work primarily, as you saw in my bio or heard in my bio, that I work primarily with individuals and families and large families with complex risks. And so as a broker, what that means is I have a variety of insurance carriers that I can access and work with to provide a customized solution for my clients. You know, they have many homes generally and large art collections and maybe multiple cars, teenage drivers, you never know. And so that gives me the ability to really customize um, risk management solutions for my clients. As a captive agent, what you find is that like a state farm, farmers, USAA, Allstate, they really are selling their own insurance a company or their own insurance policies. So they don't have the options that I have to go to various different underwriters and give my clients options. So that's really the main difference. So for what we're covering today, it can be helpful even if someone is with those firms um, and have, uh, you know, different coverage. It's always important to review your policy and understand it. And this is where most of us don't really understand what we have. And can you talk a little bit about why it is important to review one's insurance regularly? 
I think we've seen that in the past four years with the wildfires that, you know, and now we, you know, also in the last 18 months with a pandemic, that things can change pretty quickly in our world. Mm -hmm. And when you have a homeowner's policy, you know, generally, like most people, you want to set it and forget it and like, I don't want to go through that again. But Mm -hmm. actually, it's really important to take another look at it, ask your agent questions or have another agent or broker look at your policies and give you some suggestions. And I would say doing a review annually in these times would be really wise because as we've seen and it's all over the news now with the supply chain issues, you know, and so, you know, lumber is more expensive. Contractors are really busy, you know, in terms of building new communities and just remodeling homes. And so it's really not as easy as it once was to rebuild a house when it's definitely more expensive than it was a year ago or three years ago. Mm hmm. So it's important to keep reviewing your policy and asking questions because there's a lot of little nuances or big nuances with these homeowner policies as well as auto and excess liability. And how, you know, um, a lot of people to ask how frequently, which you just did. And I, like I said, annually, if, mm-hmm. if at least biannually. When yeah. the declarations pages come, give your broker yes. or your agent a ring and say, remind me what I have here. When you talk about all the things that have changed in the insurance over, absolutely, I mean, here in Northern California and up through the Pacific Northwest, where I know you serve as well, fire will come up. So Mm -hmm. can you talk about the issues with fire and how that's impacted home insurance? Oh, my gosh, it's been a huge impact on the insurance market. I would have to say 10 years ago, Esther, we weren't talking about wildfires. We really weren't. I mean, it was part Mm -hmm. of the peril that's covered in a homeowner policy. But now, of course, it's just on top of everyone's mind. And how do they prepare? Unfortunately, what it's done in the insurance market in in our world as a broker, we're seeing lots of non-renewals coming our way. So mm-hmm. finding scrambling and finding solutions for our clients is one of our top, obviously our top priority so that we can replace that insurance policy that may, may have been non-renewed by a carrier. And the reason they're non-renewing is because they don't want to have the wildfire exposure on their books. And it's happening across the board, not just with you know insurance companies that we deal with, but across the board in the industry. And it's been creating a real problem for you know, our clients. I can imagine. I mean, it just must be so, uh, I can imagine, on, I always go to the emotional side too, but on the emotional side, it's like, hey, I've been paying you guys for years and years and years and years and you're dropping me. I mean, what's that like to navigate that conversation? It's really hard. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's really hard. And I think the best thing we can do is educate our clients and keep them informed of what's going on in terms of just staying on top of the news, staying on top of what's happening with the insurance commissioner in California, as well as across the West. And um, I think it's also important to educate clients that they really need to think about how, especially in areas like most of the Bay Area, and sadly, well, homeowners need to think about their landscaping. Uh, that makes a really big difference in terms of having trees right up against your home. You want to have those removed or at least have the branches that overhang your home or your roof removed. Mm-hmm. Because what we've found out, as we all know, with climate change and the lessons we've learned is that obviously wind speeds have picked up like to 70 miles an hour. Right. We've never seen those before. And, you know, the wine country or even in the you know peninsula, the Bay Area, you know, if, a, if an ember hits your roof and it's a, you know, it's not protected or it has a lot of leaves or it's a wood roof, you know, that can smolder there for a while and turn into a big fire, a home fire. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then the landscaping I mentioned, you know, would you like to hear some details on some tips I give my clients? Yeah, absolutely. Just a little bit would be great. Okay, yeah. So one thing that's really obvious, and a lot of people like to landscape with bark mulch. I mean, I'm one of them. I mean, that's cheap, it's easy, it's pretty. But it's one of those materials that is really dangerous to have up against your home. Mm -hmm. So if an ember does get flown from a fire many miles away and lands in that bark mulch, it can smolder and turn into a huge fire the outside of the home. Mm -hmm. And cypress trees are really popular in the Bay Area, right? Those Italian cypress trees and people love them. I've got six right along my my driveway and across the street there you go more. yeah they're great wind breaks they're attractive it reminds you of tuscany it's all lovely but <laughs> the, problem, the problem i don't know <laughs> it's very hard to be reminded of tuscany in my neighborhood but <laughs> well I was trying. But anyway, yes. <laughs> um, cy- cypress trees are like literally matches, like eucalyptus trees mm-hmm. as well. So they're not a great thing, not a great tree to have up against your home. So that is one thing you can do very yeah. easily. 
Um, another thing is ember resistant vents. I know that sounds a little crazy, but I provide my clients with that information all the time of how they can install those. And if an ember does fly into the vent of a home, mm. it will just smolder and, and just die out when it's an ember resistant vent is installed. Um, and then clearly, you know, no firewood piled up against the house. That's an obvious right. one. And, uh, you know, and obviously a fire resistant roof and decking and, you know, those those structures that are up against the home. There's a gentleman that was actually on, I think it was Channel 2 News, who um, actually, he was lived in Grizzly Fats with his wife and the fire mm-hmm. was like a mile away and they were terrified. So they obviously had to evacuate and he just didn't think he'd see his house again. But Mm -hmm. two years previous, he had actually done some what we call hardening of his home. And what he'd done is replace the roof with a fire resistant roof, replace the deck with a synthetic wood deck. (laughs) And he did multiple other things, cleared trees because he was literally in a forest. And when he came back, his house was the only one standing in the neighborhood. Wow. Wow. So there is something to the landscaping and hardening your home. There's a lot, you know, a lot homeowners can do. And I know that here in Northern California, when the available insurance says, no, we're not going to reinsure you, there's this Cal Fair plan. Can you talk about what that is? Yeah, the California Fair plan. It's really, from our point of view of, as a broker or any agent, I'm sure, the last resort for a homeowner. But this is, you're so right, that's the California Fair Plan has become really the only solution for many, many people. And it really, the only peril it really covers is fire. So that's really the bottom line. And Mm -hmm. so, and they're becoming more expensive. And I think I just read where they're going to even increase their rates more because they're just getting just impacted so highly with so many people coming into the California Fair Plan. It's also important to note that that plan or the policy only goes up to $3 million as a total insured value. So that means the home, the contents, the debris removal, the um, loss of use, and all of that all has to fall within $3 million. And there are many homes worth a lot more than that in California, mm-hmm. as we all know, mm-hmm. to rebuild. That's the rebuild value and the replacement value of the personal property and all the other coverages. So the California Fair Plan is not ideal, but at least it's something for clients. And then the thing that they can do, a client can do, or a homeowner, is they can um, have a difference in conditions policy is what we call it, or some people call it a wraparound policy that actually wraps around the California Fair Plan and covers the other perils that it doesn't cover and turns the whole whole package into like a regular homeowner policy in a sense okay. it's I know going you, to be more you and expensive I, yeah you yeah. and i talked about that i wondered about that like what wraps around so the california fair is only for fire it relieves mm-hmm. the the other insurance insurers of covering for fire but they'll provide the other perils coverage for the other perils right like let's say a pipe bursts in the house mm-hmm. and water you know, escapes it would cover that kind of water damage that kind of thing yeah how much more does that overall package cost than what perhaps they had, like on a percentage level? Or do you, it's you know, hard can you to say. Esti- yeah. It's all yeah. dependent on the actual home, what its actual, what we call um, dwelling value or rebuild value is. So mm-hmm. it, it can really range. It could sometimes be, you know, two, three times more than what they were paying before. It just depends on the situation and yeah. the, where the house is. And yeah, there's just so many factors that go into it that it's hard right. to really say percentage wise. But I think it's important for people to review their policy. You know, let's say they live in San Francisco or an area that really wouldn't be as impacted by a wildfire. Still review your policies. Still take a look at them and and make sure you have enough what we call extended replacement costs, which means that that's additional coverage that goes beyond what your home is covered for. Mm-hmm. And in in, you know, very standard policies that I see, some people have 10% extended replacement costs over their coverage on their dwelling, mm-hmm. or 20%. I always strive for 100% uh, over that. But there used to be something called um, guaranteed replacement costs, which would they would replace your house no matter what. And that was particularly with specialty carriers like Chubb and Pure and AIG and Cincinnati. But that's not really offered right now, mm-hmm. unfortunately. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Boy, it's uh. So let's you know the the fires are you know everyone always talked about here with with California. The word that always came up was earthquake, and we haven't yeah. talked about earthquake at all. It's all become fire. But what about I get asked this a lot. Should I keep my earthquake policy? It's so expensive. What what should I do? How do you advise people on earthquake insurance? 
Well, that's a great question, Esther. Really good question. It's a and hard one. <laughs> I would say it's a hard one because actually <laughs> earthquake is a very personal decision, earth buying an earthquake policy, because they are expensive and mm-hmm. the deductibles are very high. So I think, especially in the Bay Area, we really need to be cognizant of, you know, is it a wood structure home? If so, is it earthquake retrofitted or A lot of people ask me what I mean when I say that. And what I mean is, is the house bolted to the foundation? Because a wood structure home can actually slide off the foundation during an earthquake, just depending on Mm -hmm. the movement of the earthquake. And sometimes earthquakes do two different movements, right? It goes one way and then it shifts Mm -hmm. and goes the other way. And um, I've seen homes. I mean, I grew up in San Francisco. I'm a fourth generation San Franciscan. So believe me, I've Mm -hmm. seen a lot of homes damaged by earthquake. Our own home was built in 1901 was actually survived that last uh, Loma Prieta earthquake because it was bolted to the foundation. So that is, I think, and I know I sound like I should be talking about buying insurance, but I really advise my clients, Dan, the best investment you can make is making sure your home is bolted to the foundation, earthquake retrofitted, has shear wall, because that will give it a much better chance of surviving. Now, buying earthquake insurance is wise, especially if your home is You know, you don't want to go through the whole hassle of retrofitting it or you're not, you know, you would rather have the security of having an earthquake policy. Mm -hmm. So it does provide loss of use, another place to live in case, you know, you can't live in your home. It's just not fit to be living in uh, after an earthquake. So that's an important element of an earthquake policy and also covers contents. But you have a big variety of coverage you can choose from on the contents in an earthquake policy in terms of how much you have, the limit. And then you have to, I guess you would coordinate that with your existing homeowners to make sure you're not duplicating. Is that fair? No, um, a homeowner's policy doesn't doesn't cover earthquake damage or loss Ah, of contents from an earthquake. So they're, might say, mutually exclusive. Yeah. This is why I refer to professionals and I do not say I can do everything for everybody because I just, you know, after even how many reviews have we done and I've worked with this for years. And it just doesn't stay with me. So it's so important to be aware of these things that may seem like nuances or may seem obvious that they would cover. And then to find out, you definitely always want to find out before an issue what you're protected for. Let's talk a bit about auto insurance. Um, I'm going to come back at the end to talk about things like artwork and sculpture and rings and all of that, because that leads into our next guest who will be um, sharing with us. But what about auto insurance? Because that's a home is typically one's largest investment. And then mm-hmm. auto is, I would imagine, well, excepting the fires, where more people have had experience using their insurance. I don't know if that's entirely true because people have leaks and things like that. But uh, if you can talk about auto, like where do people get surprised with their auto insurance, do you think? In terms of the rates? Is that what you're... In terms of coverage. Yeah. And I know in terms of, yeah, where they thought they might have been covered for something or they, it's that whole 500, you know, 500, a million, 500 and what that means and how much to carry. okay. So I think where people get the most surprised is that they think, oh, I can just carry the state limits, the California state limits. Mm -hmm. And each state has their own, but they're really low. So the California state limits for liability, I think it's uh, 5,000, 10,000. And then, yeah, so they're really, really low for bodily injury. And so you don't want to have that. That is not going to cover you when we see Teslas and you know, Range Rovers and all these expensive cars, you know, jazzing around the Bay Area freeways. Mm -hmm. So, and accidents happen, I mean, when you least expect it. So, it's important to carry enough liability coverage so that you're protected if something, God forbid, should happen, or you rear-end someone on 101. Mm -hmm. Uh, I see all kinds of accidents, or, you know, happened to me three times where someone just hit my car. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It was just sitting on the, you know, parked on the sidewalk. I mean, not the street, not on the sidewalk. (laughs) Would be a problem. Um, I was just parked on their front lawn. I didn't see what the big deal was. <laughs> Let me retract that. Um, so anyway, yeah, auto insurance is really critical because that is your biggest liability exposure. Yeah. I mean, it's just huge. And so I always advise my clients to carry at least two hundred fifty thousand for the first person, five hundred thousand for the total accident, or five hundred five hundred, or combined single limit of five hundred thousand for the whole accident, and then also that would include property damage. So property damage is if you know you um, 
you know, rear end someone else. So you're, it's your liability. You have to repair their car or, you know, you run into someone's fence or, you know, those type mm-hmm. of things. And I always advise people to, and I don't see this in all policies, which surprises me, is to get full glass coverage. I know it seems like a small thing, but, you know, replacing a windshield these days is not a cheap adventure. And so getting full glass coverage means you can get the, all the glass repaired without paying a deductible. No well, what about this thing about, you know, I'm thinking about this with full glass coverage, like you get, you know, those nicks, you know, those those rocks that ding your windshield and it starts to splinter or it may just be the ding. And does it cover that? And then my, my yes. follow up question is, <laughs> there's also this worry always that, well, I don't want to call this into insurance, whether it's home or auto, because my rates are going to go up. Mm-hmm. That's true. That's true. Um, if it's not your fault, your rates won't go up. But if you are at fault, then yeah, most likely. I just had that happen with my car. So I had to go get it fixed, you know, because it was just a little, we just ran into something on the, never mind, in our driveway. And yeah, yeah. my husband was taking me to the airport at 430 in the morning and ran into the um, a junction box. No, never mind. Oh, so, bummer. Oh, yeah. And I didn't want to put into insurance because I have a $500 deductible. And it was a little bit more than that. So what's the mm-hmm. point? You don't want to. And that's the nice thing about working with the brokers. You can actually call them and ask them, hey, you know, I had this little fender bender. Should I claim it on my insurance policy? Mm-hmm. And most brokers can just advise you like, you know what, that's pretty small. Why don't you just cover that yourself? Self-insure mm-hmm. on that one. Whereas with a lot of agents, like captive agents, you know, they they work for the company. They work for farmers or state farms. Mm-hmm. So they, they kind of have to put in the claim if you call it in. So so it's a big difference between mm-hmm. brokers and, and other standard agents. Um, so with the glass, yes. it, if there mm-hmm. is that little nick, yeah. Yes. Yes, it would be covered under the full glass coverage and you wouldn't have a deductible. And then that would question? that, yeah, would that premium go up as a result of calling that one in? No, no. Okay. No, because it's a full glass coverage. So typically no, no. Okay. It's meant for that type of a claim. That's what it's for. But it's an endorsement. It doesn't come automatically with an auto policy. You need, to, as the broker or agent, you need to add that. And a lot of people don't have it. I think they think it costs too much money, but I think it's very minuscule in terms of like premium. So mm-hmm. it's worth having. Yeah. Yeah. It's typically not a very large fraction of the overall policy, if I recall. No. You typically don't even no. notice it. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And then, you know, another important part of auto coverage is the uninsured, uninsured motorist coverage, because mm-hmm. there are about 40% of Californians are uninsured or mm-hmm. underinsured, meaning they just carry the state limits. Mm-hmm. And that is not a good situation. If they hit you, then your insurance needs to respond to repair your car, cover any you know bodily injury that might have happened. So that's an important insurance limit to look at as well on your auto policy. And then rental car coverage, if you need a car, if your car is damaged in an accident, you want to be able to have some wheels to get to where you need to go to your work or, you know, yeah. take your kids to school, that kind of thing. Yeah, living without a vehicle yeah. in these days is really challenging. Um, exactly. Even in even in these modified COVID times, it's really challenging. Um, exactly. What, when, when there is that underinsured or uninsured, that hits your vehicle and is the issue then that your coverage goes to them and if they don't have that much then that's all your insurance can go for and you have to fill in the difference unless you have have, uninsured yeah yeah if you don't have the proper limits then yeah you might have to fill in but hopefully you've carrying really good limits nice high limits and then hopefully you have an uninsured uninsured motorist endorsement of at least one million on your umbrella or excess liability policy. And that would mm, kick well, in as well if it accident is a big accident. Yeah, let's talk about umbrella insurance, because that's one of the things that surprises me quite a bit is how few people carry it and how important it is and how inexpensive it is. So can you talk a bit mm-hmm. about what umbrella is? Well, an umbrella policy, and it's also there's also the, another term called excess liability, and they're slightly different. But in any case, let's f- stick with umbrella. Umbrella policy goes over your auto and your homeowner's insurance as additional liability coverage should those underlying policies not be sufficient with an accident or a liability claim. And it's really important to have because it can really spare you a lot of grief and anxiety if something big does happen and you're, let's say it's a big auto accident and the other party 
unfortunately passes away, mm. um, the family could come after you saying it's your fault. And, you know, so they could have start to, you know, hire an attorney. And the first thing attorneys generally go for is to see what the umbrella coverage is. And that's why you want to have enough to at least cover your net worth if that's possible. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, you want to really protect your your assets that way, because that's the first thing that will be called into question is what is the umbrella coverage? So, you know, if you own a home in the Bay Area and it's a market value of five million and you have liquid assets of another five million, it would be really wise to carry a ten million dollar umbrella. And like you just said, they're not expensive. It's probably the least expensive part of your whole insurance portfolio. And how does it handle the attorney's fees? Well, the carriers that we work with, the insurance companies we work with, those fees are outside the limits of the umbrella. So your ten million would not be eaten up with attorney's fees. Mm-hmm. They would cover those. So is there a limit on the attorney's fees or? No. So no wonder they (laughs) ask if you have umbrella insurance. Yeah. I mean, (laughs) it's a no brainer. Right. (laughs) But it is really important. I mean, what uh, the things that come up, let's let's talk. uh, And I know one of the things you advise a lot is about if you have umbrella insurance, important things to check is who are the named insureds. Can you talk a little bit about that? Generally, the name insureds on a homeowner policy, auto policy, are the people who own the house or the car, right? So those are the name insureds. But you also, if you have additional drivers in the house, for example, you want to add those people to the auto policy as additional drivers. And I have a lot of clients who have nannies who drive their their own cars Mm -hmm. and drive the children in their own cars. Or their own cars, but also in the in the parents' cars, mm-hmm. and so we always add those nannies to the auto policy just to be sure that they're covered. And so, it's if your home is in a trust, it's really important that that trust be named on the homeowner policy as an additional interest or additional insured. Depends on the insurance company and how they handle that, but it should be named so the trust is protected because it's a it's an entity owner of the home. Or an LLC. A home could also be listed in a, mm-hmm. titled in an LLC. So the same thing applies. On an umbrella policy, you also want to name the trust or LLC so it's protected through the umbrella policy as well. Does I that mean, these sense? are just little gotchas, absolutely, because it, the trust is an entity. It's not a human being, but it is an entity. And these are the little things that can really surprise people. One doesn't want to think, oh, I have this great policy, $10 million, and then realize that they've neglected to list uh, individuals or trust that can right. be accessed otherwise. Yeah, that is so true, Esther. That's a really good point. And especially for you as a financial advisor, you know, bringing mm-hmm. that up with your clients, because I'd have to say most people I talk to for the first time, they don't know this, that little fact. And yeah, or they don't have their house in a trust. They're like, oh, shoot, I need to put my house in a trust. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And yeah. yeah, and that's really important too. I mean, you go through all the trouble of creating this trust, and I mean, that's a this is a sidebar, but uh, confirming once the trust is complete that everything has been retitled appropriately, et cetera, and it, exactly. it ties back to insurance. Most people think of account names and things like that. Often, as you know, the estate attorneys take care of deeding the house into the trust, but I'm sure you've run into situations where the trust is not named as owner of the home. And the, the individual have. thought it was, yeah. yeah. So, and then the final, you know, I want to spend a little bit more time on household help. You brought that up in terms of nannies driving, and it can also be uh, more and more as uh, our clients are in the sandwich generation of they have mm-hmm. younger children plus care for aging parents. Um, it could be caregivers for aging parents who are driving them to you know, go shopping or something like that. And I have found so often, I think it's this thing, I think it comes from people going, well, I just want to keep it under the table that I have household help. Um, I, and it comes to worry about paying taxes appropriately and things like that, that we really encourage people to put them on a payroll, have the appropriate withholding done. But this is a separate issue even from that is how important it is to name the household help into insurance policies. And if you could just talk about what the risks are if one doesn't do that. Actually, um, I don't know if you know this, but in California with uh, admitted insurance programs or admitted homeowner policies, it carries automatically workers' comp. 
So mm-hmm. I just had a claim with a client who called me saying that their house, their housekeeper had fallen down the stairs mm. and she's not named on their homeowner policy, but they automatically have through the liability section of that policy, workers' mm. compensation. So she is more full-time and we listed her as full-time. But it's important for people to remember if they have household help, they have an in-home caregiver caring for an aging parent, that they really, they tell their insurance agent so that they can make sure they have the right amount of coverage. In this case, it will be, you know, her injury will be completely covered because of she, we, we knew about her, right? Mm-hmm. Um, it doesn't matter whether she's under the table or not. We really, it's, it's really important to, you know, disclose that, oh, yes, we do have household help in the house or a nanny or what have you. If mm-hmm. they're part time, it automatically comes with the policy. If they're full time, there is an extra little charge to, and it's pretty minor, to add that person onto the homeowner's policy and the excess liability policy, just to make sure. You brought up another point, too, in that, um, well, I'm not sure if you really brought it up, but I'm going to bring it up. That <laughs> the, homeowner, the homeowner is actually, if they are employing someone, they're actually, an, they're actually employing them. They're um, an employer. Yeah. So there's other risks that go along with that. And especially if there's someone that didn't come through an agency to, into your home, mm-hmm. it's really important to remember that they can actually turn around and sue you for unfair labor practices, mm-hmm. sexual discrimination. And we call this in our world employee practices liability insurance, EPLI. And mm-hmm. that can be part of an umbrella policy as well. It can be an endorsement. Some umbrella policies include that automatically. Not very many, but um, when they're specialty carriers, I know it's an endorsement, and it can give them at least, you know, another two hundred fifty thousand dollars of protection should that sort of scenario happen. And it's just important to keep in mind that if you're employing someone in your home, you are an employer unless they come through an agency. Um, I'm so glad you brought that up because again, these are things that that just don't uh, I wouldn't know. And again, that's why it's so important to connect with someone who's as consultative and educational as you are. You know, you're not trying to push. I've I've gone through a lot of reviews with you where you go, you know what, what they have will work. And I would recommend these upgrades. But um, so you're not a salesperson at all. You're a consultative professional. Um, the couple other things before we close, because we're going to have to close, this always happens. There's so much more to talk about. Um, <laughs> you did talk about, you know, how much contractors are in demand. And it's because of all the remodeling that's gone on during COVID, rebuilding from fires. Um, what what insurance is available when people have their homes being remodeled or rebuilt? Is that something that they should look at their policies about? Oh, that's an awesome question. Thank you. Yes, um, that's really important. I'm seeing a lot more of that now, too. So in terms of people remodeling and then just building a new home, um, with the pandemic, I think homes have become a real center point of people's mm-hmm. lives. And so they want to make it work for their family. And so remodeling is really a big deal when it comes to a homeowner insurance policy. You really have to check with your agent first to see if your policy will cover your home during a remodel. And typically it won't, especially if the house is vacant. Of course, this is kind of a more complicated answer as well, just because if the house is um, vacant and also you're investing a, quite a bit of money and adding square footage into the home, the insurance carrier is going to be a lot more nervous and they'll probably say, you know what, that's not something that's in our wheelhouse. You know, you need to go get a separate policy, like a course of remodel policy, or if you're building a house from the ground up, a course of construction policy. And these policies protect your home while you have, you know, contractors and subcontractors in your home while you're, you know, changing the structure of it or building the structure. So it's protecting your investment in this structure as it's being changed or built from the ground up. So it's called a course of remodel or course of construction mm-hmm. policy. And every scenario is different, right? You know, so yeah. you have to consider and talk to your agent first about if your situation would, qual- you know, if you would need a course of remodel policy or construction policy. And I know you've gone through that too. And again, you're not someone who's going to say, sell something, provide something, recommend something that is not needed. So Derry, I'm so sorry. We have to close up at this point just um, because people have arrived at their destinations. But the last thing um, we'll talk about because um, our next guest, you know well, Andrea Roth on appraising art, furnishings, et cetera. So if you could just close Mm -hmm. up talking a little bit about coverage for those other objects in the home, jewelry, art, furnishings, etc. 
Oh, yes. That's another great question. I work with Andrea quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And it is really important because your homeowner policy doesn't cover those fine, expensive items like fine art, expensive jewelry. Some policies have a little sublimit of 2500 or maybe 7500 but they, your homeowner deductible will apply if you have to use that coverage. So you really want to have your items appraised. And someone like Andrea, who appraises fine art, she's also really connected in the appraisal world. You want to have someone like her appraise your items. And that way you can list them on your on a separate, it's in some cases, a separate insurance policy. It's like we call it a collections poli- policy or a valuables policy. And it's great because it has worldwide coverage. There's no deductible if the item is lost, if it's scheduled, which means it's mm-hmm. itemized and its appraised value is itemized. And there's a detailed description of it. You can even mm-hmm. you can even itemize expensive road bikes. That's a big wow. you know passion for a lot of people. So yep. it just depends on the carrier. Um, but jewelry, fine art, um, all of those things should really be separated out from the personal property in a home. And one last note, I always tell my clients, if nothing else, go through your home and video all the contents of your home, like each room. So you have an idea and then upload that to the cloud. So if something does happen, you're going to be really upset and you won't be able to remember all the things you own. But if you have a video recording of it, mm-hmm. or at least a record, it'll be a lot easier for you when it comes time to make a claim with the insurance company. Uh, Great suggestions. It's just so helpful. I I hope the audience can really hear all the information and knowledge and experience Derry has to share. Derry, if people want to reach out to you directly, how can they find you? Well, um, they can email me or give me a phone call. My phone number is 650-227-7214. And my email is dwisnam.com at risk-strategies.com. And Thank I'm you. always happy to answer oh, questions. Sorry. sorry about yes, that. <laughs> I know. And, and, and if that's fine, um, you are always available to answer without, you know, a, a no obligation conversation. And if people want to uh, really sit and review their overall financial plan, and we always again, engage on the insurance part, because as I started with this, you can have, as you hopefully have uh, been more illuminated, now you can have a great portfolio that's been doing wonderfully. And you can, you know, your your income is coming in fine, but then something can happen and it can really topple. It doesn't matter almost anymore about those other things. You're glad you have them, but it can really interrupt what otherwise would have been a very comfortable situation. So if you'd like to come in and or connect with me about a review, I can be reached at gatespassadvisors.com, the contact us button, always available to talk as well. Thank you again, Derry, so much for your information, well, you. your presence and your knowledge. Well, thank you so much, Esther. It's always a pleasure to work with you. Thank you so much. You're Derry welcome. and Esther, this was, this was amazing. Uh, I, I'm glad that people have the rewind button because this was packed with so much information, uh, so much education. And I appreciate Derry, you being on the show. And of course, Esther, thank you so much for bringing her on the show. And our last thank you is always reserved for you, the listening audience. Thank you so much for tuning in and listening to the Women and Wealth Podcast with Esther Sabo. If you have not subscribed to the podcast yet, please click the subscribe now button below. This way, when Esther comes out with a new podcast, it'll show directly on your listening device. This makes it really easy to share these podcasts with your friends and family. And this is an important one to share. If people Mm -hmm. don't have the insurance coverage that they think they do, that's a rude wake up call if something does happen. So please share this with them so they they can be prepared. Again, it's easy. And I'm going to interrupt you, Eric. I'm sorry. That's my forte. And it's easy to remedy. It's very easy to find out in advance. That's the only other lasting thing. Yep. Yeah, that's it. One phone call. That's all all it takes. Again, thanks so much for listening today. For everyone at Gates Pass Advisors, this is Eric Johnson reminding you to live your best day every day. And we'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to the Women and Wealth Podcast. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast so you receive notifications of new podcasts as they become available. Check out the website at www.gatespassadvisors.com for more information. This content is developed from sources believed to be providing accurate information. The information in this material is not intended as tax or legal advice. Please consult legal or tax professionals for specific information regarding your individual situation. The opinions expressed and material provided are for general information and should not be considered a solicitation for the purchase or sale of any security.